The Considered Life by Stefan Boublil. Chapter 9 Education. Whether you started with Aristotle, John Berger, or me, discovering new ways of seeing inevitably leads to regrets about not having started earlier. I realized my need to personally structure my chaotic world at 38 years old, and I can tell you not a Seinfeld marathon goes by that I don't think about the squandered years spent dismissing myself. Youthfully enticed, I might have glimpsed a road, if unlit, that led to curiosity beyond standardized literacy. If only there was an established system that taught humans, as soon as they're able to learn, the value of consideration, the value of perspective, the value of understanding before diving into other knowledge. What's that? Schooling, you say? I, I don't think so. Schools scare the shit out of me. I cannot enter a classroom or any institution of lower or supposedly higher education without feeling pressured to homogenize, comply, and regurgitate. Schools seem to have devolved from the Athenian ideal of elevating the mind, body, and imagination of its 5th century BCE students to the modern one of hoping they choose the correct answer out of the multiple choices lest they be left behind. Plato would not be happy. Since I have generously been allowed to participate in the raising of two children for the purpose of seeing how quickly I can fuck them up, at least that's the only reason I can figure, education is on my mind every day as a much broader matter than the mere schooling which seems to solely concern itself with advancement. Education, in stark contrast, intersects with creativity, vision, development, intellectual awareness, emotional relationships, and ability. It goes hand in hand with being a social animal. And so, when it comes to my growing firstborn, Zoel, I do wonder upon every new word, point of view and attitude, wondering how he learns, how he digests, and how he assimilates, attentive to the structure before it is filled with what will soon be forgotten to the profit of culture, the reason I am not as concerned with what he learns. Whether you remember what year Belgium declared independence from the Netherlands does not matter as much as the reasons why you acquired that knowledge. Whether you were made to wonder and eventually care about history, and whether that interest for the past gave renewed clarity to the present, and in turn, inspired your vision for the future. The platform is extraordinarily more important than its content, which is why I have a problem with the educational system as it stands, for it merely schools us, mostly checks our ability to remember. Schooling does not test for what is the most important part of knowledge, the acquiring. Isn't that the case with most things in life? Aren't journeys, in the end, often more significant than where they lead? Why then are parents so surprised to hear from educators that life at home greatly impacts their child in school? They are shocked, shocked, that their progeny might also need familial direction, not to say homework, but a rich cultural environment from which to draw. How could that possibly be a revelation? Well, because some believe that most products and services have already been devised, priced, and can be readily bought, without a second thought given to individual examination. If you feel this way, as indeed most do in this Western world, why should schooling be any different? Why shouldn't we be able to rely, much like we do on $10 buying two hours of entertainment, on $250,000 buying 18 years of instruction, which, in turn, allows us to lay back while the knowledge supposedly enters our children's charming little brains? We should not, and we cannot, because each human brain simply does not assimilate information in exactly the same way. And it is up to us, the guardians, to know their stees. We keep sending our kids to schools with shelves full of awards, in good standing, renowned, Ivy League, private or charter schools, without ever really wondering if the method fits the subject. This was always a point of contention in my own life because I was not just a class clown, which would have been fine enough for my hoping to be proud parents, but also a disruptor of schools. So much so that just about every year I was expelled from one and had to start anew in another. 
from good schools to worse schools to schools for troublemakers, and finally, to schools for kids that nobody else wanted. A journey culminating with a recommendation to a Parisian establishment of great distinction named Charlemagne, with a reputation for being able to break any kid, it would be my last resort, since they took in anyone with a less than glorious past, anyone on whom other institutions and parents had given up, restoring them back by some brutal magic to the good graces of society. To this last chance academy, I wasn't even accepted. The only alternative for Jewish parents out of options was to let another people's God decide what should be done with me, specifically by sending me to Catholic boarding school, which was upsetting to say the least. The reason my school experience weighs so heavily on my way of looking at life in general and education in particular is simple. Twelve schools in 13 years gives you perspective. I had all the time in the world to observe, if unconsciously, how geography and method influenced the way knowledge was ultimately imparted. And imparted, it wasn't. Mostly because none of these otherwise fine establishments knew what to do with a personality like mine, and by extension with every misdiagnosed misfit that went through their gates. Each school's honed routine, applied universally within its walls, discounted individuality to the profit of predictability. That is how it was then, and how it still goes today. Leaving aside the social void that switching schools created in my life, going from address to address and finding myself in the same predicament every time, regardless of public, private, or religious system, it made quite clear the fact that knowledge mattered less than the strict adherence to a formula hell-bent on ignoring character. It sadly left me to conclude that education was about regurgitation, no more, no less, and that children ought to consider schools an exercise in patience rather than an experiment in culture. That is why, when the time came to make decisions for our own children, Gina and I pondered long and hard about how to address the educational process as part of a wider net. So, Manhattan dwellers that we were, out we went, looking for organizations that might facilitate such ambition. But every single establishment we visited brought me back to those years spent on the worn, misconceived benches of my youth and made me feel nauseous, panicked, unable to breathe because they still felt so forceful and inflexible in the ways they chose to reach their assigned younglings. Even though the subjects at hand were raw and trusting little things, every school spoke of grades and lessons, homework and expectations, each a step on the ladder of eventual success as defined by those who had succeeded. Then we went and were interviewed, as it is what one does in New York City, at a school in Greenwich Village called the Little Red Schoolhouse. And we were astounded by what we found. In what I thought would be yet another welcome new checkbook speech about the importance of excellence, not one word was in fact uttered about academia. They spoke of life learning. They spoke of a child in his context. They spoke of culture, of the school itself as merely a starting point, not a goal. The neighborhood the school inhabits, they explained, provides a much larger canvas and would be taken advantage of. In literally leading their students around the block on a regular basis, they offered an opportunity for discovery as potent, if not more so, than the classroom, since everything in their path, whether a bug on the ground, a loud car horn, or an old woman yelling at ghosts would let the small lives observe and venture a guess at their place within a larger world. Every new encounter would afford a new chance for understanding how, not just learning that. Hearing such dissension from the usual discourse left me with tears streaming down my cheeks because I had never heard an academic institution take such a thoughtful position. It opened my eyes and made me realize that this exception notwithstanding, I had actually been a fool to wait for a school, any school, to provide such a framework for my children. We are the ones in charge of their education, not a methodology unrevised since antiquity. We, not unreliably credentialed strangers, are the ones with the responsibility to raise them. We are the ones with the power, one I promptly ceded to Gina for safekeeping and proper allocation, of course. The point is that in time when most information is available and customizable to suit, 
Nobody can claim to hold exclusive knowledge anymore. Not teachers, not schools, not even well-meaning parents. Information has become the commodity thereby exposing the need for better design of the information, which seems lost on the representatives of schooling. What does a formal education even represent these days? To my mind, it represents two things. In the first half of youth, the learning of basics, reading, writing, and socializing, skills easily acquired within the confines of the family. And in the second half, if you're lucky and start to feel the unmistakable sense of self that conveniently comes with not being liked by girls, you start making choices based on personal instinct, not expectations, and stand in contrast to the roadmap provided, which erroneously promotes goals instead of process, the source of all consideration, for which parents are an important motivator, yet are usually the ones arguing the inverse. They tell you that if you go to law school, you will have to be a lawyer, that such an opportunity cannot be wasted by a change of mind later, that lawyers made good money, hence have a good shot at grabbing what is left of whatever dream your country offers. What is amiss in this off-detail plan, however, is that the intense studying of one subject will and must encompass the forming of opinions about said subject, and that the conclusions reached might boil down to, this is not for me. There's nothing wrong with law school. There's much to learn there but the paths that lead from its graduating doors should be perceived as varied as those out of art school. The binary system we have set up has turned out to be extremely difficult to ignore or even dismiss, that which seems to commend that if you want to be this, you have got to do that. That said, our world is indeed changing thanks to an ever-expanding range of professions, making it harder for the people who love us to proudly tell their friends at the bridge club my daughter's a doctor, isn't that wonderful? I hope our generation further destroys this way of thinking to the profit of a more pluralist mindset. Although I have my doubts, for as much as we reconsider our own lives on our own terms, we still want safety for our children, which often unfortunately boils back down to the roads most traveled. The question is, why prioritize presumed stability over fulfillment? Some people may see it as a necessary compromise. I see it as a choice. Choice destroyed the negative connotation of compromise, and not simply through an easy trick of rhetoric, but by motivating the selection process instead of conceding control. So it is with life, and so it is with education, not simply as a parent, but an adult faced with choices about how the kids should learn, as well as your own development. This is an excellent adventure filled with experiences and possibilities that all can learn from and often refuse to unexplainably. Why? Knowledge, culture, and education are words whose meanings have become interrelated at best and confused at worst. Still, decisions must be made as to how we learn, and each and every one of us learn differently. That is the inference of a wonderful book called The Film Club by David Gilmour, a Canadian film critic. His factual account begins one evening when he's sitting with his 16-year-old son in order to complete Latin homework that the kid has, again, forgotten his textbook for, protesting that, no, no, I can still do it without the book. That is when the dad, quietly exasperated at his boy, who cannot seem to get it together, has this breathtaking realization that schooling is probably wrong for him. He looks at his child and musters up the courage to ask, Do you want to be in school anymore? And the kid, smelling a trap, vociferately defends himself. No, no, I just forgot my book. I, I can still do the homework. The dad reiterates, That's not what I'm asking. Listen to me. Do you want to go to school anymore? Because if you don't, we can talk about that. The kid, a million thoughts racing through his mind, jumps out of his chair. That's a possibility? Trembling inside at the prospect of what he might have unleashed and the explanation he will eventually have to give his ex-wife, the dad continues, Yes, take the weekend to think about it. Incredulous and overwhelmed, the boy shouts, Absolutely, take me out. I don't have to think about it. Please take me out. What the father did with the next three years of his son's life was an exercise in faith the ramifications of which held more meaning to me than any curriculum I had seen until then or since. 
Let me attempt to paraphrase. Okay, you are going to leave the educational system, the father proposed, which obviously does not cater to your needs. But three days a week, we are going to watch movies together. Three days a week, I'm going to choose a film that I believe to be great, or not, or perhaps merely interesting for how it made me feel. And we are going to talk about each after it ends and see where that conversation takes us. And that is what they did. Three days a week for the next three years, they saw hundreds of movies, every single one a lesson, every single one a starting point for a discussion about life. Such an idea I found to be, above all, courageous. Of course, Citizen Kane and Goodfellas, King Kong and the African Queen have stories, characters, and moral dilemmas potent enough to teach anyone in the throes of confusion the value of various points of view, let alone a 16-year-old. At a time when you are developing, experimenting with your body, your brain exploding with thought, and all of a sudden you are taken out of a classroom in which Virgil's Enaid studied in a manner less than lively would have probably been a waste of time, you understand that there are no wrong experiments. And I wish my family had had Mr. Gilmore's insight. Watching significant perspectives on the tribulations of a mafia boss, a lonely housewife, a scientist, or a priest, the presumption is that the filmmakers have done their job and portrayed life as it may be, asking questions about the human condition that, raised between credit sequences, remained entertaining, whereas within the narrow aisles of the classroom might have put you to sleep. Regardless of whether this turnaround could ever be implemented on a mass scale, and I doubt that it could, or even should, the principle of it is extraordinary. And again, courageous. Enforcing outmoded methods in the name of habit feels, in contrast, cowardly comfortable. Fearlessness is needed in order to educate yourself or attempt to educate others. This is a process in need of serious undertaking, one that requires action, not reaction, one that must be produced by and for you. The film club was conceived by Mr. Gilmore for his kid and no other, for what he saw was an opportunity for learning and not one advocated for anyone other than him. What should be urged, however, is to vow never to stop watching your particular kid until you understand how he or she learns and to cater to your findings. That may very well be within the unfairly discredited public classrooms of your neighborhood. That may very well be in an environment like that of the Little Red Schoolhouse. That may very well be traveling the world and learning by doing. That may very well be the dirty little secret of education. That it is what you make it, together. Obvious, tried, cliche, but nevertheless well documented. However you choose to go about these matters, you will ultimately develop in larger part thanks to the influence, favorable or nefarious, of your parents than that of your school. My son, after all that, was not accepted at the red stain institution of my choice and instead went to an equally financially demanding Quaker establishment. I did not feel particular regret, for it had helped me register that which I apparently could not on my own that active involvement in context, perspective, and culture mattered, even for a six-year-old. It also made me conscious of the fact that the money I paid for private school was for my egregiously borrowed peace of mind, not the advancement of the kid. It was to make myself comfortable and secure about what I was told to believe he should learn. Nothing more. Somehow I felt at ease with the purported years of research and care that a private facility tells us in their glossy pamphlets they have invested in and which public schools could never hope to carry out. Bullshit. I was fooling myself into believing such entitlement so that I could shamelessly outsource that part of my job to them. I made peace with that at the time, for it was a choice, not a compromise. But I can tell you now, years after the fact, that there is nothing that I learned in that school that would not have been at another without. For the record, Gina disagrees with my conclusion on this point. Still, I think that the considered way to educate is not to throw standardized information at small people. It is to find out who they are first, discover what interests them or what they show talent for, and enhance those qualities. Education starts not with the knowledge of facts, but of self. 
Reflection, once sought, delivers on a silver platter all the resources a human being needs to develop a subject, now simply in need of an object. For the record, Gina agrees with my conclusion on this point. The possibilities of education lacking in specific schooling are why I have always been fascinated with the dropouts, the ones we now celebrate, which we would have never admitted to being role models just a few decades ago. Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Richard Branson, all quitters, kids who didn't care much for being told what should be important and went out to seek the answers for themselves. Their example demonstrates not that the choice is about school or no school, but about knowing what is right for you, finding your way through thousands of options, thousands of promises, thousands of questions to answer for yourself, to educate yourself, to teach yourself. You will exit at the other end a person neither proud nor particularly humble, neither bored nor unusually exhilarated, but someone whom you will recognize in the mirror. And then teach others. Keep in mind that we are all students and teachers at once, that whoever you are, wherever you are, there are the lessons you assimilate and those you disseminate, sometimes just by being, just by example. You may not even notice, but somebody is watching you and learning. Knowledge is transferred every day from person to person in the most mundane and anonymous ways. And we must be aware and take that responsibility seriously. A conversation between two people may start as a perceived passing of judgment, which, after a few minutes, with generosity on one side and an open mind on the other, can ultimately be a chance to learn. It is the best perk of this club called humanity. There is but one obstacle. Ego. Some may say that it is to blame for the failure to apply the above, that it turns every conversation into an opportunity for a contest, that it drowns the beauty of exchange into a cesspool of pride. But I don't believe it is ever undesirable to do anything because of ego. After all, it enables us to care about ourselves enough to take action. Ego is our airbag, that which makes us feel that our life is worthy enough to attend. With the modicum of subjective consciousness, we can all see that we have not exactly been model tenants on this earth and will soon be selected for extinction. But the ego, superhero that it is, prevents us from accepting this as a limiting factor. Ego is not detrimental. It is self-worth, nothing more, nothing less, and is to be nourished and profited from. Now, if ego turns a potential learning experience into an arrogant lecture, that is a matter of form. Meaning presumably comes naturally, but form needs practice to reach the expected outcome and will prove to be a valuable ally as you start to put who you are at the service of what you want to say. If the words you choose do not perform for others as expected, if they are upsetting or insulting, do not interpret that disapproval or a lack of understanding as your weakness, merely perhaps as a lack of tact on your part. You must continue to purposefully design the words that you choose, for the refinement of form is a lifelong pursuit which becomes functional when wielded with meaning. The possibility of indignation, theirs or your own, should factor in on principle. Try yourself out, contribute, stumble and get back up. There's no getting around the fact that free speech offends, always has and always will, which is the reason why language has, for too long, been peppered with nice and great and wonderful and fantastic, meaningless, overused superlatives that hide the truth of our intentions and are the reason why we no longer recognize it when it is spoken. Candor has, for this reason, come to be seen as hurtful, pompous and offensive, which it is not. It is simply an opinion, no more cause for alarm than disbelief in a greater power. Yet, it is rejected with some consistency in societies high and low. And I blame a lack of education, a lack of comprehension of human behavior, of how people properly communicate. We get so lost in formalities and manners embraced from olden days that we forget that honesty is useful. We forget that the encoded words are the ones that best convey meaning. I'm not saying I don't like your place, but... Then what the fuck are you starting with? I'm not saying I don't like the place for. Most likely, I'm guessing, because you don't like the place? Why can't you just say, I don't like the place? What and whom do you think you are hurting? We, the human race, 
waste so much more life dancing around each other this way than if we allowed ourselves to speak unvarnished words, learning better and quicker from people, objects and events than our current use of language apparently tolerates, having become overcrowded with self-satisfying conventions, a cycle of disingenuousness unstoppable until someone asks, what do you mean, great? We must understand that every one of our words matter because someone is always listening. We are fooling each other left and right with borrowed and agreed to language, so much so that every conversation becomes similar, every compliment standardized, every expression bland, which may be why we hail the supposed originals, the mavericks in our culture or circle of friends as the last practitioners of honesty. He can say pretty brutal things, but don't get offended, that's just how he is, is how we are warned about the sincere among us. Wow. Yet those are the people whom we come to care about the most for some reason, in whose company we have a good deal of fun and the most interesting arguments. We condemn them as anomalies who embarrass others at parties, yet secretly we envy them for being apparently exempted from the tyranny of chit-chat that binds the rest of us. This is not strange and is reproducible by anyone, anywhere, in any social circle or circumstance. And it stems from education, whence the rules of behavior were first established, where how we learn is now showing the way forward. Education, from the youthful age of zero, should introduce us to a framework in which we learn never to be afraid to verbally express how we feel, to say what we mean, in which candor is not a matter of decorum, but a matter of duty to ourselves and the rest of the human race. That is the power of education and one we must take seriously, whatever age we are or pretend to be. At the dawn and dusk of time, we alone are responsible for ourselves, and that is a promise that mere schooling unsurprisingly cannot deliver, for that is not its purpose. Only a romantic notion both promoted by and serving our need for sufficiency. But sufficiency is not enough to develop one's character, just as wishing for stability is insecure yearning. We must better educate. We must better speak our minds. We must better ourselves. P.S. Both my children now pursue a public education, and I try to relax. <laughs>